Hello there, hi. Welcome to Butterfly Effect, a podcast all about interviewing people. I'm your host, Tristan Edelman, and welcome back. Been gone for the past couple weeks, just didn't have episodes together for the past two weeks, but uh, got one today. And that that kind of relates to a point I want to make. Um, I'm trying to get people on the show, obviously, and I wasn't able to do that for a couple weeks there, and... Uh, part of that was me, just things happening, and I uh, wasn't hustling like I used to. Uh, still trying to get back in the swing of things, but also uh, I need some I need some help. I need uh, some people I should look into. Um, you know, email people, tweet at people, saying, "Hey, come on this show." Um, I I I kind of need that that kind of support. Um, and I, I mean, I don't want people doing my work for me or whatever, but I, I do like to hear most importantly about different people that I wouldn't necessarily have thought of. That's really the crux of it. But also I need people for the show to keep the show rolling. Um, so, you know, there might be little breaks like that. I, I was really hoping to avoid ever missing a week and I missed two in a row, but, uh, you know, that's how it goes sometimes with life and things, things just kind of fall apart, uh. Best laid plans, something or other, you know, you know how it goes. But yeah, so uh, I've been, I've been doing stuff, <laughs> uh, looking for things to do. Just been kind of being very vague, but uh, yeah, looking for work. Freelancing is is a is a tough world, and uh, it's fun, but tough for sure. And. Uh, I don't know, just recent stuff in the news, obviously, is really gets you down. Uh, just I just felt kind of helpless with this this country and this world lately, and and, uh, and with, with the shooting in Orlando and stuff like that. And then just a few days ago, uh, Anton Yelchin, great, great actor, uh, died in, in a tragic, tragic accident that... Uh, you know, I guess it didn't have to happen. I, that sounds like a weird thing to say, but uh, it wasn't self-destruction. It doesn't seem like it, it, it wasn't, you know, intentional. It was just accidental, and that's even more. It's harder re- harder to reconcile that I think than uh, someone who was going down that path, or you know, it's just it's hard. And then it makes you uh, question mortality and things like that, and what, what, uh, what's going on with your life. So, it kind of bummed me for a little bit there because uh, I just recently seen Green Room, which he's phenomenal in, and and uh, a couple of good friends have recommended other stuff I need to check him out. And so, uh, yeah, just kind of uh, r- ruminating on stuff like that. So it's been a fun two weeks. And so I talked with Scout Tafoya. Uh, film critic and filmmaker uh, on the recommendation of a good uh, friend, friend of the show, who's been on the show, Michael Burns made that happen and uh, looking to scout wor- Scout's work and uh, liked what I saw and uh, smart guy, We t- this is a long one this might be the longest butterfly effect and uh, it was good, it was a good one I like the long ones um, we talk about all kinds of stuff, death of journalism <laughs> Uh, not really getting any more positive, but you know, that, that's that's the mood I've been in. So, but yeah, check out uh, ch- check out Scout's work at uh, RogerDeber dot com and and his video essays. The uh, Unloved series is a great idea. Um, and uh, check out some of his movies, Honor Zombies, Honor Zombie, uh, all that stuff. We can talk. He plugs it at the end, but uh, just a lot of cool, unique stuff he's doing. So. Check it all out. So I'll see you on the other side of this conversation with Scout. So what's what's uh, new with you? Are you uh, doing anything exciting? Yeah. Recently, um, I'm kind of in the middle of like 200 different things. So <laughs> I'm uh, I'm in a group uh, like a I don't know. It's like it's weird to call it a band because it's essentially just me. And uh, my girlfriend and another friend and a drum machine, 
and I wrote mm. all the songs, and it's, I don't know, so we're, like, not a real band because there isn't, like, full input from everyone yet, just because we're still kind of new. Um, but that's called Sergeant Troy. I'm really happy with that. It's kind of like a, I don't know, I wanted it to be, like, a kind of an early 90s, 4 AD, kind of, like, shoegaze, chapter house, my bloody gotcha. Valentine thing. Um, mm. I have written a script for what will be, like, I think my 21st movie. Wow. Um, we're shooting that in September. I'm really excited about it. It's kind of, I don't know, it's, it's kind of out there. It's, uh, I, 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 I wanted it to be kind of like Louis Malle's film Black Moon, which is this great, uh, crazy, uh, like dystopian fantasy thing. And it's mm-hmm. laced with all this crazy Freudian imagery and there's mm. Joe D'Alessandro's in it looking as gorgeous as ever. Mm. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm excited, too, because two of my movies uh, that I'm sort of most proud of, uh, this movie, I Am No Bird, which is a kind of a modern Jane Eyre thing, is playing Chicago filmmakers awesome. in August. Really excited about that. And my movie set in a brothel, uh, House of Little Deaths, I think it's going to play this thing online called Fan Dependent Films. Um I don't have as much information about that, but uh, it seems like it's a cool thing, and the people seem very nice, so I'm I'm excited. I'm excited for people to finally watch these things. Yeah, and are you still are you still writing? Oh yeah, doing absolutely. I'm criticism and all that stuff. I'm in the middle right now of a, uh, a starting piece for uh, Brooklyn Magazine on the New York Asian Film Festival, which is really cool. Um, they, you know, I got to see. Uh, like almost a dozen of these things to try to figure out which ones would sort of fit the the theme of the piece, and it was really really neat. Uh, just because they they're like it, it's it's a mix of these kind of like laid back American indie stuff, but filtered through modern Asian culture and these totally insane genre things. Sure. Um, which remind me a lot of like the Chinese and Japanese horror stuff from the 80s, movies like Shrunken Heads, um, and, uh, like, it, to a certain extent, like the guinea pig stuff, but maybe less kind of, like, gonzo than that. I just saw a film called The Tagalong, which is like a... It's like... It reminds me of, like, a like a early 70s Christian horror film, but sort of with... Okay. A kind of Buddhist slant to everything, and it was just huh. so terrifying and so awesome and crazy. Like when it finally takes its like last minute nosedive into like maybe you shouldn't have gotten that abortion. Like it hardly <laughs> matters if everything until that point had been so crazy. <laughs> wow, um, that uh, sounds like it's a an eclectic mix of movies oh, going absolutely. on with that. I'm watching this film yeah. now called The Laundry Man, which is so much fun. It's a it starts out like looking like it's going to be very ordinary and boring, but it gets great. It's this dude who, uh, like, as like a cover for murdering people, works at like a big industrial laundry, um, uh. and and but what he's actually so he starts killing people, but then he starts seeing the ghosts of his victims. So he goes to a medium to help him kind of get rid of them, and that means kind of like figuring out why they had to get killed in the first place, and in many cases just killing the people who had them. Like it's yeah, it's. It's so nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Gets crazy. Yeah. Well, that, that's good though. It sounds like you're uh, a very busy guy. Yeah, it's uh, it's tough to find a minute to sleep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I also work at a bar called Snowdonia in Queens, which is great. It's Welsh, um, and I have to. I'm still sort of like mulling what the next month's column for RogerEbert.com is going to be. I do a thing there called yeah. The Unloved. Yeah. Um, and Every month it's a film that sort of got trashed and nobody saw when it first came out that is, like, worth looking into. Um, but, uh, yeah, I still kind of have to... I'm, like, weighing something. I was going to do a Robert Frank film, but the problem with those movies is that it's not that they were hated, it's that, that just nobody saw them and nobody remembers them, and I don't know if that's quite the same thing. Right, so, so the focus of the of the series is not necessarily something that's just overlooked. It's something that is specifically panned or... Exactly, exactly. Like, as much as I really, like, I want people to watch um, something like Candy Mountain, which is this wonderful um, 
it's um, it, it's it's they made it in 1988, but it's still sort of about the death of the 60s. Um, Robert Frank was a photographer um, who came here in the I want to say the 1950s. He has a great book called The Americans about uh, um, just these beautiful uh, black and white photographs of life in America, largely in the sort of you know kind of what you might have called the underbelly back then. It was all stuff that like polite society didn't want to look at or whatever. Right. Um, and uh, he started making these kind of bizarre shorts with uh, people like Jack Kerouac. Um, and, mm. uh, you know, he made a famous documentary of the Rolling Stones. Uh, it was this kind of like weird warts and all behind the scenes thing called Cockfucker Blues, which you can't really watch a good copy of because it was sort of like, I don't know, the attitude towards it was, was one of shock and awe. Like imagine, I mean, even today you, you couldn't release a film with that title. You, oh, sure. You know what I mean? Like, well, and if it's warts and all rolling sounds, I'm sure that would have, oh, the actual yeah. content of the movie was pretty, uh, exactly. Exactly. especially for the time. And the thing that's, that's funniest about it is because it was, you know, kind of like, you know, shunted off, um, as much as, like, you know, the few people who saw it really enjoyed it, uh, but it was because, it, you know, it, it's basically fallen into disrepair now. If you're seeing it, you're seeing bootlegs, which makes it seem all the more dirty and wrong. Yeah, <laughs> which, is, which might be good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, it, it, like, it really does add to the kind of layer of mystique that this film has sort of accrued over the years. Yeah. Um, I remember I used to work at a record store I'm from a place called Doylestown, Pennsylvania, and I worked at Siren Records, and people used to trade in uh, uh, bootlegs all the time. And we had a guy, we had like a bootleg guy who would come in. Of course, we didn't call it that. Um, but we, I, when I stopped working there, I hadn't seen that dude in, in years. So I don't know if like the internet kind of put him out of business, which is entirely possible. Yeah. Which is funny to think, right? The bootleg man going out of business. <laughs> <laughs> That dude used to come by with all kinds of great stuff, and like that was how I found out. You know, I I, I used to collect all these live recordings, especially of bands that I really liked, like Radiohead. I had I had a I think I had a concert for every letter of the alphabet. Um, wow. And so he must have at some point brought this you know terrible looking bootleg DVD of Cocksucker Blues, and I remember watching it one day in the store and like put it on the TVs and like really wasn't like aware of what, like, it just didn't occur to me that, like, kids might walk in or whatever it was yeah. in the film. Um, and, yeah, it was, like, we just, uh, there's another thing, too, we got traded in the craziest stuff there. I mean, like, people, people would basically come in, they bring in whole boxes of just whatever, and in some cases that was, like, you know, family photos, old porn magazines, like, actual hardcore DVDs, um, wow. and, uh, we got Triumph of the Will one time, um, so that was how I watched that. It was one night, it was, the store was dead, and I just put it on one of our computers and watched <laughs> it sort of in private and kind of hoped nobody came in. Um, yeah. <laughs> it would be a strange thing to have to explain. <laughs> Do you say it's Siren Records? Siren Records, yes. Is that a, is that a chain? It's or not is a that... chain. We are, one okay. of, uh, we are one of America's proud independent record stores. Okay, because I, I'm not from the East Coast, so I don't know if that was a thing. I'm no, it's funny. You're East not Coast. the first person to ask that, too. Yeah. I remember. Because it sounds familiar. I don't know why, but... Uh, yeah, I don't... It, there must be something else... Um, there must be, like, some other thing that sounds like it. Or I know. That <laughs> something. I'm really not sure, but it was, like... Um, uh, yeah, you know, somebody came in one day, like, with something to return, and they were like, well, I bought this at your Philadelphia location. We're like, we do not have a Philadelphia location. <laughs> 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 um, so. so did that did that record store... Because you were a record store, but you were also... Uh, sounds like dealing in movies and DVDs and stuff like yeah, that absolutely. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I got there, we were just putting the VHSs into bins to sell for a dollar each because um, yeah. DVDs were taking over. And when I got there, it was funny. There was like a little more care put into how we were selling them. We could kind of get away with having like we had a criterion section for a lot of years that I like really lovingly yeah. looked after and, <laughs> right. and, you know, made sure all the boxes were dusted up and everything. Um, mm -hmm. And we had, like, you know, when I got there, there was, like, a tour section. So if you, like, you know, you wanted to know where the Hodorowsky stuff was, he had his own card. So that was, like, a oh. huge uh, 
thing to me when I like first wanted to start getting a job there because it was like, oh my god, this is everything I could ever have like wanted. Because at that point, you know, whatever I was like ten or eleven, there were only about thirteen directors in my mind. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So we sold DVDs, and that was where I got like so much. I mean, the Criterion section having that in the store made me aware of what was being released. And the more these things came in, the more that I went to the website to see what else was coming out, and that kind of put me on uh, on the hunt for great new or you know new to me world cinema and stuff like that. right. I remember the week well, that uh, Sweet Movie and If came out, it was like apocalyptic because I watched those two films and was like, oh my god, these are, like, these were, they, like, they blew my mind, like, absolutely changed the kind of stuff that I wanted to do and the, like, you know, I just, like, what I wanted to read and how I wanted cinema to be political and all this, like, those, that, that was a very big week for me. <laughs> <laughs> Watching those two movies. Well, what was, were you, did you already ha- have a, a love for film oh, before you started working there or did it kind of just foster what you already had? Yeah. I, oh, okay. So my dad basically is responsible for my, <laughs> my, and the funny thing is it wasn't even like, it, it, it was almost like it was like osmosis. It was not like, Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? He didn't he didn't sure. sit me down and be like, you know, you have to watch this. He would talk about stuff like that and then I would just come home from whatever from school or from playing with friends and the movies were just on. They were always on and I would sit down and That's watch cool. them no matter what they were. Um, cuz like I like I told this story before but um my uh my first memory ever is of watching Alien. Like um I'm like say Alien or Aliens? Aliens, the sequel, yeah. Okay, um, okay. I was on my parents' bed, and I just sort of like looked up as if from a nap. Like I must have fallen asleep, um, and I woke up in there the last 20 minutes of Aliens playing, right, where she goes and fights the queen and rescues Newt yeah. from the basement and then gets back on the spaceship and all that. So I'm seeing, you know, the scene where Lance Henriksen gets pulled apart, and like he's got the weird, like he's got the, the, the white fluid in him instead of blood because he's an android, but I don't know any of this right. stuff. So like... I'm seeing all this, and it's, like, making this impression where, like, I'm not frightened by any of it, despite the fact that it's crazy and out there, because I, like, I don't know, I must still have been, like, kind of half asleep and just sort of accepting that these things happen. And so I watched the last of that and then, like, must have just wanted to watch it more. I saw that movie, I don't know, hundreds of times when I was a kid. Like, you know, like, the VHS had, like, scars on it. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, played it out. We switched to DVD. Um and uh, so, like, that was, you know, and, like, I, my dad used to watch, you know, uh, Heat. I used to, like, watch uh, okay. Heat a whole lot. I used to watch the second cassette all the time. My mom was a big Last Mohicans fan, so I was on a fair amount of time, uh. too, and she had the soundtrack. And that was another thing, too. My parents bought soundtracks, so even when I wasn't watching the movies, I was hearing the music. So it was just wow. this constant thing where the movies were all around me all the time. And so, it, like, it occurred to me that there really wasn't a time where I wasn't going to have some, you know, that where film wasn't going to be some part of my life. Like, I grew up with it all around me, like, just in the atmosphere around our house. And yeah. and then as I got older, my parents, like, and again, it was, like, I don't even know that there was a question about it. I don't remember asking for a camera for Christmas in fourth grade. I might have, honestly. I don't really remember, but they... So they gave me that, and then I'm starting, you know, I'm making movies with action figures and everything else, and then yeah. get to high school, and like, like with so many things, you get to high school, you discover girls, you stop doing all, the, like, well, sure. your creativity is kind of stymied a little bit because you want to seem cool. That like all your effort is <laughs> goes into right, like, yeah. Track. Effort is not cool in high school. No, not at all. No, you can't have interest. No, or try to do anything. <laughs> Least of all when they involve like, like reminders of childhood, because like I don't know, like yeah. Girls had it easy. They knew exactly when to like, like when dolls were no longer a thing. Like I right. never ever walked into like a a girl's house or like you know bedroom or whatever like that and saw evidence of childish behavior, which is that's a pretty big that's a pretty big difference among girls and boys. Like I never saw I never like saw evidence that girls were still playing with toys. Yeah. And I saw it everywhere at my guy friend's houses. <laughs> well, yeah, and I mean that's what made you know me personally the I, I didn't play with toys, but I was a you know big video game nerd and stuff like that. So kind of uh, that established that kind of oh yeah totally. Thing going. And I remember I I still played video games probably until like I don't know maybe like ninth or tenth grade or something like that, and it must have been. 
it like it was right around uh breaking up with the first girlfriend that I stopped playing video games forever. I don't know what it was. My interest just it was just like gone. Mm. Like because even now it is still perfectly normal and in fact like in many cases very profitable for like grown men to play video games. That's not I mean yeah, I yeah, I write about video games. <laughs> that's, that, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Like you my my boss Ebert, Brian Solerico, he he writes about video games very eloquently. You know, what I mean it's just like it's part of our culture like anything else. So yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't that same thing. There wasn't a switch where I was like, "Oh, I better stop doing this because it's childish." It was just like something that I just yeah. Stopped. It's just not your uh, your yeah exactly. Interest. I remember <laughs> when I was in college. I made a bunch of my friends feel really bad one day because they were all playing. I think it was Left for Dead. I was sleeping on their couch because um, my apartment in Boston had been a scam. Um, I was paying this oh. dude who like dressed like an extra in Wall Street. Um, <laughs> and I was paying him rent, and he was just like a lunatic. He was constantly hanging around the house and just like in a towel, like trying to have conversations with me, just kind of like dripping wet in the kitchen Ew. about like his back pain and stuff like that. I was just like all the weirdest stuff. And like all the other tenants were these uh, young Asian women um, who who really, I, like as far as I could tell, they didn't speak English or they didn't speak it well enough, and they certainly weren't like comfortable enough in this house to like speak to yeah. me. so I would see them on my way to the shower or whatever or like if I needed to use the oven which I tried not to do because I really didn't like being in that part of the house <laughs> um, they would just sort of like smile and wave and then go back to their rooms um, but so I was I was in there for as long as I could and then one day the real landlord showed up um, and had no idea who I was like didn't know where the money was going blah 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 and my landlord I guess had just gone on the lam or something like he was just subletting it to me but he didn't tell me that um, like because he himself was a subletter which is just like such uh. an awesome thing and we, <laughs> we, we I had a, uh, my friend Kyle over afterwards and we went through the house just like kind of looking for clues like like little detectives <laughs> trying to figure out what had gone wrong and we found in his like, like, the room that he designated for himself that he stayed in whenever he was there, we found in there tons of get-rich-quick stuff uh, and, like, rich dad, poor dad, and, like, self-help and all this. Like, oh, so this is just one scheme of many. He probably had apartments all over Boston that he was pretending he owned. Uh, <laughs> I hate shit like that. Yeah, it was, it was <laughs> nice. And then even, like, even better... He called me like six months later while I was staying on somebody else's couch to ask if I would testify on his behalf, <laughs> which is like perfect. That's just like, that's a level of confidence that I will never possess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, that's a, that's a good, like, uh, it sounds like a movie. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like a crazy character in some, some movie. Yeah. I, I kind of, I kind of like wrote it into this screenplay I wrote uh, while I was in Emerson because how can you not like how can you yeah, yeah. incorporate that lunacy into something like it was just like hanging over me the whole time I was like what that like you can you believe that you've just <laughs> gone through this um, so yeah so I was staying with my friend with that same friend Kyle we like we like <laughs> we ransacked this guy's room looking for like just like stuff just to see like what it was and then he let me stay on his couch for a couple of weeks and my rent was I bought them Left for Dead when that was brand new. Uh, <laughs> and he's like, looking back on it, I, I ran into him a little while ago. I went up and visited him, and he was like, I can't believe we made you do that. <laughs> like, that was such a, such a horrible thing to make someone well, do. Well, I mean, that was your rent, though? <laughs> yeah, that was my rent. I had to buy him video So, games. I mean, that's 60 bucks. I mean, I don't know what the situation was. But... No, it was actually, back then, it was 100 Oh, that's not good. Yeah, Xbox games were a little a little more expensive in Boston at the time. Or maybe it was just because they were new or that we were just going to places that gouged us. I'm really not sure. <laughs> uh, so it was 100 bucks to stay there for, like, I don't know, three, four weeks, something like that. Um, you know, which is not the end of the world, but he still felt bad about it. And I made him feel worse about it when one day I went, I, I, I came home and he and his roommate were, were playing the game and they were like, like, don't you want to, you want to, like, play or whatever? I was like, no, that's all right. I don't really, like, know how these things work anymore. And, like, they're like, don't you like video games? And I said, and I, like, and I was be I was being rude about it on purpose because I wanted to yeah. feel bad about it. But I was like, yeah, usually I'm just, like, I'm like, it's so stupid, but I'm usually writing, and that's why I can't play video games. And they both just, like, felt terrible. <laughs> I'm usually being productive, yeah, so I can't. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh, gosh, I'm just so busy making something of myself, which is such a <laughs> bad thing to do. Like, so that's, 
if they have to look back and feel bad about making me buy them video games, I can now look back and feel bad about making oh. feel bad about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's karma. That's if it, yeah. The laundry. So, uh, what'd you go to? What'd you go to school for? Uh, I went for film. I went for what Emerson yeah. calls visual media arts. Um, and it's funny. Everybody asks me now why, like, why I went to Emerson or was Emerson nice? And my response always is the classrooms were well lit, and that's really <laughs> down to. Um, <laughs> Because I was walking around, I was like, oh, this environment is nice, and I will actually not hate it here, learning things. Um, because that was, I spent a semester at Temple, and that was, like, a huge difference. I hated it there. And it wasn't, it wasn't even necessarily that, like, there were sexual assaults every week, because there were, but um, it was just, it was, and it was, it was just, like, this is how snobby and, like, kind of, like, film nerdy I am. It was, like, a question of aesthetics. Like, I hated being there. I was on... I was living on the 14th floor of their dorm building. And so I would look out the window and just see like, just like smoggy, disgusting mornings of North Philadelphia sprawl for as far as the eye could see. My roommate kept uh, empty pistachio shells in his trash can for too long and would always kick them over. So it was like living in a steakhouse. Um, (laughs) And like, I just, my classes were too huge. I was like, I... Everybody was also doing this thing, and this is like, this is, I don't, there's got to be a way to fix this. But everybody who goes to film school, every first year film student, mm. needs to be the most important and the smartest kid yeah. in the room. And it's, yep. it's not, it's not, it, 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 it's awful. You don't want to collaborate with anybody because they're all like, they're all, they've got so much stuff they need to let everybody know that they know. That's how it is for, uh, I go to school for journalism. Same thing. Same thing. Yeah, and it, and it it isn't just first year. It sticks <laughs> around. That doesn't go away. <laughs> no. <laughs> so that's I mean like I I I understand what you're, what you're uh, yeah, you, saying wholeheartedly. Yeah, completely. Oh yeah, I had yeah. a friend who just graduated journalism school, and it was like it was like a special program, I think. So I don't know if it was necessarily first year. Like I think a lot of those guys are sort of viewing it as like it was. It was uh, I'm saying this. It was grad school. It was definitely grad school. Yeah. And she used to tell me all the time, like, oh, my God, I just heard, like, like you know, the, the ways that people find to tell you how culturally sensitive they are <laughs> like, um, or, you know, how how aware of you do. I just like I I don't know, man. Like, that- well, so I, I, I go to ASU. OK. Which is Walter Cronkite School, which is actually the good the one good part of right. ASU. And uh, and a lot of the people there are either want to be PR people because they include PR in the journalism program, which is kind of like, oh, still makes me kind of feel weird, because mm. they're kind of the opposite. Yeah, exactly. Or they want to be, what's that? I said, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it, Or they want to be sports uh, journalism people, because that's like a thing that they've started doing yeah, um, right. in full force. Or they want to be like, I don't know, they just have these like aspirations of, of grandeur, yes, and they and they they want to you know be they want to have these conversations about ethics and oh question all the the rules and stuff like that. So that's fine, but just please just calm down. You got a bunch <laughs> of little Edward R. Murrows running around. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Well, and the the sad thing is that a lot of them probably don't even know who that is. Ugh. So it's like even more like you know annoying. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jesus. I mean, you know, I like I had to let go of a lot of my. You know, it, 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 it's so easy when you're, when you're, when you're a dumb kid who has, like, educated himself enough to know, I don't know, like, 10% more than the people around him about stuff that probably doesn't matter. Like, when I was in high school and college, my impulse so frequently was, like, the sky is falling. You know, these people don't know who, <laughs> who you know, Masaki Kobayashi is or whatever. Like, they don't, yeah. they don't know... <laughs> they don't know Mickey and the Ruse or whatever, like whatever it was. And it's just like, you have to let it go. You have to let it go. You have to not sure. be precious about it because the people who know will, I don't know, at this point, they probably won't even get rewarded for the knowledge. And so if I like you, you, holding on to that elitism, which was like such a huge part of my sure. identity for such a long time. <laughs> like, I think it's still somewhere inside me. <laughs> oh, no, of course. And, like, it's tough to get rid of because what, what that, 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 you know, that personality trait does feed your, it feeds your protection of the art form, but also your love of it. They're, they're, they're sort of like an Ouroboros thing about it. Like, 
you you love this stuff and you want to be protective of it, and so you're worried about people who don't understand it coming in and sort of you know just saying things. I mean, just yesterday there was all this furor about somebody writing an article about Spike Lee's Jungle Fever and calling it hilariously outdated. And naturally, a bunch of the critics who were around when that movie was new were like, "What the fuck is this? Yeah. Like, what are you kidding me? Like, put yourself in out like put yourself in the shoes of your average moviegoer in in 1986. Like, you know, like how how are you gonna how are you gonna possibly like you know, uh, yeah? So there, there's this you know there's there's a very very real concern that people are misunderstanding the history or, or, or just keeping themselves willfully ignorant of it and not sure. really understanding where this stuff was. But at the same time, how much can we let that hinder yeah. progress? Yeah, and, and how much can you expect people to, you know, devote their life to figuring that stuff That's out? That's exactly so, right. And like, so I, yeah, I, I, I have to, I have to tell myself stuff like, and I'm not saying I'm like some, you know. Uh, expert in journalism history or anything like that, or even because I've I've even started to fall out of love with the work. So I mean I don't know what I'm doing with my life, but um, I just it's just the you're right the willful ignorance part will sometimes get get your goat. Like that's the part that will. Oh sure, and and naturally the people who are the most flagrant about it are are the ones who are going to get paid more than anybody else. Sure, I have, they're the PR people. Right. right. <laughs> I have a friend who texts me like. I don't know, once, twice, uh, like every, every couple of days they'll text me to basically be like, did you read this article? It's appalling. And I'll go and I'll find it and I'll be like, yeah, you're right. I like, I can't believe this. And I'll like go on this long rant about this. And he'll always end it by saying they're making more money than both of us. And it's, yeah. it's absolutely true. And that's yeah. another thing that like, you have to decide how mad you want to let that get you. Yeah. Because ultimately I, you know, I don't know, maybe like, and maybe this is bleak too, but if you sort of frame it in terms of legacy, when everybody here writing right now is gone, what are the things that anybody's going to want to read twice? Sure. I don't know. I don't, like, and that's maybe the wrong way to do it too, because so much of journalism is it's it's you know it, it, there's a, there's a sort of an ephemeralness to it where where well yeah you you read the wonderful work of whatever like you know i i imagine that people reading newspapers every day in the 1970s no matter where you were were reading some of the finest journalism ever done sure i mean watergate sure stuff. absolutely i mean that's you know that's the go to right there you know you yeah. got Woodward and Bernstein and you've got that Bradley yeah. editing and all this you know i mean like you've got titans working yeah. you've got you've got people on tv news who have integrity and they care and yeah. you can tell okay. that they care yeah, you've got Cronkite, you've got all the guys who would, you know, who did 60 Minutes, and you've got, like, sure. people who really put themselves there and really cared and really wanted to make sure that beyond getting the story, what they got was was people. What they got was, you know, that, that their care for what happens next. That this wasn't just a story, it was, it was, it, it was putting your finger on, on something. You were, you were feeling the pulse of something. You were evolving right. with a country that was still in a lot of trouble. And, yeah. you know, you, you didn't read those, like, I don't know, like, I've, I've, I've only exposed myself to, again, like, you know, little bits of this, but you didn't get the sense that it was, we're doing this because we just want you to keep buying the newspaper. Sure. And that's wonderful, yeah. and that's great, but how frequently now do we go back and read these pieces to remind ourselves what golden age journalism... No, and I, I mean, that's, you're right, there, journalism news in itself is ephemeral because it's not new, right. you know, in a week. It's, and, and I have no, I know that a lot of the stuff I write is disposable, right? Like I, I, oh, totally. I, I, I it's, completely it's, quit, it's people consume it once and it's not like a great film. You know, you go back and you watch this. It's like, no one's going to go back and read this, you know, review I did right. of a video game, right. even though I did a lot of work into it. No, no, no. I completely but, agree. Yeah. It, it, I do want to make something that is more lasting though. So that's part of what this process is is you know practicing some kind of craft to to get to something else that is hopefully more lasting at least that's my thought oh absolutely i mean you know the stuff that the usual beat i have for brooklyn is and it's, i'm calling it that is even sort of making it seem more important than it is is doing uh, uh rep blurbs 100 words on a great old movie playing somewhere in the city right Sure. And I love doing those, and I love uh, my editor, Mark Ash. Mark Ash. He's great and clearly cares about what he's doing, and he's got, like, a real, I don't know, he's just, he's very nice, and he's very humane, and I really, really like working for him. Um, and 
you know, but the thing about those pieces is, as, as proud as I am of having maybe, like, whatever, like, captured the essence of that work of art in a hundred words as best as I possibly could and submitting it knowing that in for that particular thing there was nothing else I needed to add. That's great. I'm proud of that work. In a year or two, like, what, you know, like, <laughs> nobody's going to remember yeah. that you were the one who nailed the, <laughs> you know what I mean? The, as, the hundred word blurb in the... Exactly, of, of 92 in the shade or, yeah. or whatever it is. Yeah, but when you're writing it and when you d- you're doing it, you're satisfied and you feel vindicated right. in some way. And maybe so. that's, maybe there's something to that is knowing, like... Doing your best work for on a deadline, giving your, you know, whatever, like a hundred watertight words in, a, you know, a day or two, like not even, like I can, you know, these things I've, I've, I'm, I'm sort of on the wavelength of the assignment so much now that I can kind of do them in about a half an hour with editing and all that, and even that, it doesn't take that long. And I really, I don't know, I love that process. I love thinking about these movies for these blurbs. I really do. But maybe, maybe, maybe there's something to the idea that, like the. The, the sort of like peak journalist mindset is being able to do these things quickly and be satisfied with them and send them in and know that it doesn't matter yeah. if nobody reads them. <laughs> well, so as, for as much landmark pieces, you know, or things that, you know, people wrote uh, or did like, you know, all the stuff that Cronkite did or um, Woodward and Bernstein, you know, all that, they did so much thankless work. Right. You know, leading up to and after that, during that, you know, with that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was I was watching uh, Spotlight again recently, and uh, I don't know how you feel about that film. but We can talk uh, about it after this story. <laughs> uh, I really liked it, but because um, I'm hoping what it does for journalism, what all the president's men did for journalism, which was you saw like a huge uptick in people uh, wanting to do that work. But the one thing I had with it with Spotlight was that, I'm like they did so much work. Like it, the the way the you know a movie works is that it shows them doing it and like oh they got the story and they did some stuff and now that they, they won basically right quotes. right. But it's like they, they did, did so yeah. much like like no one understands that process of journalism of like you know foot, feet to the pavement you know just like yep. <laughs> you're pouring through those documents like it's it's knocking on doors like years. getting getting yeah. nose having to go back yeah. and all i think okay so I'll, I'll say just like on on a purely sort of like cinematic thing i think the movie the movie works best as a uh a depiction of that process and i think as a film about um you know, the actual step-by-step gathering of information and shaping it and all that stuff. I really do think that it's, I mean, it's riveting. I really had a great time watching it. I think the movie has problems sort of outside of, like, sort of extra textual issues. There, It doesn't, it's not, I mean, it's visually indistinct. You can see him trying to go for that David Fincher Zodiac thing and sort of falling short of it because Tom McCarthy just isn't that guy. He's not that director. He's never had that distinct visual style. I think the problem in the performance level is Rachel McAdams and Mark Ruffalo. Ruffalo is trying to be Brando. Rachel McAdams is trying to be invisible. And I think the two of them sort of create this like huge sort of reverse polarity at the heart of the film where there should be this collaboration between the two of them. I think... Um, the dude who played Matt Carroll, his name I now forget. Um, he's uh, Carroll now works at the MIT Journalism Lab and um, does some pretty interesting stuff there. And he's also like a like that thing at the end of the movie where he says, "I'm like I'm gonna write horror books now." He actually did that, and he's got them on Kindle. You can read. Oh, them. Um, Brian Darcy James. Brian Darcy yeah. James. There you go. That's yeah. his name. He's he, like so many of the like great character actors we have now. The the youngest brother on Bloodline, for instance, is a musical theater guy. He was on. Yeah, I was gonna say I had, I did not realize that was him. Yeah, right. Watching the movie, I'm like that. I like I'm like who is that guy who played him? I look, I'm like wait a second, it's the guy from Something Rotten. Yep. And I'm like that did not look like him at all. It didn't sound like him. He was just a different guy. Yeah, he hated the mustache apparently. But they made him because <laughs> really? I th- personally. I think that if you're going to be a newspaper man, I think you need a little facial hair. <laughs> yeah, he looked, he looked good he looked with like the mustache. Good. He looked like a normal guy, and that's the kind of Yeah, guy. he looked like the dad that he was. He looked like a dad. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, like, I, I, going back and watching all the President's Men now, I mean, I watch it as much for Pacula's amazing direction as I do just, like, how everything looked. And that's, the, like, that's what I miss about, like, those things. That whatever the whatever the, like, blue-collar job is that so many of those films are about, whether it was, like, being in a band or, like, you know, renting boats or being a detective or whatever, the 70s-ness meant everybody yeah. looked like a human being. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Like we don't we don't have as many Gene Hackmans today as as we no. as we should. People who are kind of willing to sort of fade into the milieu a little more and look like human beings instead of like movie sure. stars. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but I I wonder the spotlight effect because again you said something it's not gonna ha- it's not gonna do what presidents meant. No no no. And, I, and, I and hope. you you consciously or not you you hinted at why which is um it ends and they've won and that's. Sure. And then outside of the movie itself, it won even more when they gave it Best Picture, right? So that yeah. means that's a closed loop that they've created. There's no entry point into the film at that point. You've seen them yeah. do their work, and they win. And then once the movie has done, it's done its work because it got the Oscar. So it doesn't need anybody else to come in there and say how good it is or whatever. It doesn't need the, the participation. It doesn't need the active engagement that so many of the other films do. Because sure. when All the President's Men is over, what's happened? We've been fucked. The country's been yeah. fucked. But well, I, and I think, too, in, in today's world, we, there's so many... You know, Spotlight, as great as it is, I don't know what it pulled in in terms of it did, you know, box office. It did well. For what? Sure. I just, like, I can't imagine, like... It, it just gets buried by the sheer amount of other right. things out. You know what I mean? Did. Like, President's Men made an impact because it had its space, you know? That's true. And And the thing is, people were, uh, unlike today, people expected big movies to be, and I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm viewing this through the modern lens. They expected big movies to have something to say and they expected them to say it eloquently, not because people, uh, it's not that your average moviegoer was smarter. It was just that we kept making smarter films and yeah. so people got used to those things, and you could say all that stuff. I mean, just like if you want a if you want a quick lesson about how different everything was in the Carter years than there is today, watch the bad comedies and see just how much they had to rely on. I mean, they were terrible ideas and terrible jokes and terrible wordplay, but it was still they were still appealing to some part of the 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 the, the, the like. The smarter part of your brain had to know these things in order to dumb it down for these stupid jokes. Sure. There's a movie called Americathon from 1979, right before Carter left office, where the sort of fate of the world hangs on a telethon hosted by Harvey Korman. Or and maybe it's not Harvey Korman. Maybe it's like Fred Willard. I forget now. But <laughs> it's somebody like that. And it's just this, sure. like, you know, there's all this, you know, really tone deaf you know, sort of jokes about uh, Native Americans and all like communism and all this stuff. But at least the American public at that point had to know all those things in order to find this stupid comedy funny. Now, sure. I mean, there's a reason people don't make, I mean, there's a reason the political comedy sort of doesn't really happen anymore for no. the one part, but it also is the reason that people look back fondly on something like idiocracy, which isn't yeah. even all that well made. No, but, that's the whole... I, I, don't, I think that's the whole appeal of that movie, too. Right, it's, it, it's easy, right? It's an easy thing, yeah. and everybody gets it. But again, when's the last time something like that's come out? In this I mean, it made with those people. And the thing is, Idiocracy still got buried. It was supposed to have a wide release, oh, and it didn't. Yeah. Didn't it take, like, three years to get released or something like yeah, that? Like, it was I, done, and then it... Wouldn't be shocked if it did. I remember when it got made, because I read an article in Entertainment Weekly about it, um, when they yeah. were still making it. And then I heard nothing about it until suddenly people were calling it a cult classic about five years later. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember reading something about how it was, like, held forever. It was just, like, in distribution hell. Oh, sure. And I have no trouble while. believing that because, A, yeah. you've got studio heads wringing their hands about the fact that they're releasing that movie while Bush is still in office, and B, <laughs> it's still politics. And how many people yeah. were willing to laugh about politics back then? How many yeah. people could still get... I mean, even as broad as those jokes are, I'm willing to bet that they flew over some people's heads. Sure. And that's... Which is the irony of that Exactly, that right? Movie. <laughs> like, I... I that you can't there 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 used to be a kind of a respect for the average moviegoer and we've we've kind of got, that doesn't exist anymore no i mean you look at i mean even in the independent circuit i mean i'm well you know i i i, I as part of this new york asian film festival thing i watched this movie called apocalypse child right and it reminds me of every kind of you know mid, like let's let's say lower budget but mostly we're still talking about mid budget because they've got named stars in it mid budget like family-based dramedy that went to Sundance in the last 10 years. It's that kind of ambling, what are you going to do with your life, you know, living in your bedroom kind of thing. It's the Duplass brothers, and it's, you know, you know, it, it, it's all these movies which sort of built, you know, this thing. And, and once upon a time, I think that that was 
built on on you know respectable footing, and because the America hadn't was, wasn't getting movies like that, so there was a need for that. Yeah. And now yeah. they're just everywhere, so everybody. Yeah. Them. I know. Yeah, I know what you mean. And so I'm looking at you know this this. This film that it made in the Philippines, which is essentially the same kind of movie that America is getting, and like if they're just sort of starting this wave of like you know kind of you know amiable indie family inspirational exactly it's yeah. usually what they're going for right yeah. right right it, you know then like I don't know there's just this thing where we can only handle six plots and three of them involve superheroes and I hate it <laughs> just fucking hate it people gave Roland Emmerich shit like two days ago because he called the Marvel movies silly oh yeah I saw yeah. and the, their response was well you made Day After Tomorrow and I'm just thinking you know what that movie at least had personality like it, it, it didn't it, it looked like a Roland Emmerich film but it didn't like can you imagine that movie getting made now with like like sentient global warming that's insane that's an insane idea but yeah. it's insane with personality and those Marvel things, they don't have personality. If they do, it's because they give them to somebody like Edgar Wright and, what's his name, uh, Peyton Reed, who's a great director, and they give him Ant-Man so they can have a little fun with it. But you know what? It's still a Marvel movie, honestly. Like, I think Ant-Man was a lot of fun, but, like, I would much rather have seen Peyton Reed do literally anything else because I respect what he does with himself when he's not chained to a franchise. Yeah, that was, that was Edgar Wright's big thing with that, that movie. Yeah, of course. That's why he left. Yeah. Because what are you going to do? It has to look like all the other Marvel movies. It has to have the same cinematography, the same lighting. You have to be yeah. able to watch them all in a row without anybody having to adjust their eyes. It's like, it's crazy. The things that we don't trust people to do anymore. Yeah. Like, you know, on my movies, I, I shoot them on DSLRs with lenses that I borrowed from my dad's old film camera because I want them to look like something. I want them to look... Yeah. Like, nothing that you're going to see in a movie theater or on your phone or whatever this week. Like, whatever else, I don't want anybody to walk out of these films and think someone, anyone else could have done that. Like, sure. And that's, like, I want that of our journalism, too. That's why, yeah. like, I don't know, like, you know, your, your, your hope about Spotlight, about people sort of wanting to take part more and wanting to buy more, re like, newspapers and subscribe to all these things... Part of that would be wonderful, but the other part is you get these kids who are coming into it and they're going to the schools of journalism like, you know, like they are, but they're getting into it in the wrong thing. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, it, they want to do PR. Yeah, they want to do PR. And Even adults, you know, like a lot of these people will go from, you know, journalism jobs to PR jobs. It's just that it – and I understand why they're teaching it, honestly. Like a good PR person understands journalism. Of course. You know what I mean? Like the worst ones are the ones that are like – uh, you know, telling you to do things that are like, uh, that's not how this works. You right, know? exactly. But at the same time, I, I, I saw some, oh, shit, I wish I could remember. I saw some infographic or something about the percentage of PR jobs to journalism jobs over the past 10 years or something. And I got really depressed. Well, I'm like, oh, my God. That's is, man. Like, you know, yeah. you can't even blame people. And the thing is, like, no. a lot of the nicest people I've met since moving to New York and sort of, you know, trying to do this semi-pro film critic thing, they're PR people. They're lovely. No, I, lovely. yeah. I, I, I know, you know, there's good PR people and... Uh, but I'm not. Try, I'm not trying to point, paint them as the enemy or something, even though in some ways they can, they can be. <laughs> but, but, I don't know. It, it, it's just a... It's, it's a you're right. You can't blame them, but it is slightly disturbing to see the trend oh, go. Oh, sure. That way. Well, I mean, well, you know, I, maybe, and I think that maybe you're you've got more of a ground's eye view of the thing as far as print journalism is concerned. I'm, you know, I'm I'm talking to people who loved film, and this was the way that they found to you know take part in it, or you know they just loved the culture of it. You know, whatever it is. There's like, and the thing is like, okay, so. There's a great, great music writer named uh, T. Cole Rachel. I've been reading that dude for years. Uh, he was a bartender at Rich Lane in New York for a long time. Um, hmm. But he just got a job at Kickstarter um, uh -huh. because that makes more sense than just continuing yeah. to write for whatever, for Pitchfork yeah. or Consequence yeah. Sound. How much, like, you know, and, and nothing against those publications. Like Consequence of Sound, some of my, like, my best friends have written for that, and they're great writers, and I think that that place really does harbor a good atmosphere full of good creative writing. But 
I mean, I'm sure that all you got to do is look at the paycheck to be like, oh, yeah, I'd rather do the other thing. And like, yeah, I don't know anything about those. Like, I don't know. I don't know what you would do working for Kickstarter. My friend David Nin works there and, and it, like is clearly having a great time. And they're lucky to have him because he's like a wonderful dude and he really knows the business. He knows all these things about it. Um, but I don't know. I don't know how to do what he does. So that's a big part of why I think a lot of these other writers kind of never like quit. Like, I know a lot of my friends despair daily over whether or not they have, I mean, we don't have job security. That's just a fact. No. <laughs> like, no. how many people are staff writers who aren't worried that one day somebody's going to walk in there and say, I know. hey, I bought your newspaper, you're fired. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, even, you know, like as a freelancer, the, the goal is staff position. But even at a staff position, you're like, you're right, there is no yeah, you're not safe, distinct, you know, yeah. like, not even, you know, whether it be print, a website, even, you know, like you bought by someone else and then you're fired. Oh, exactly. you know, just like, it's just, it's, yeah. Or we're not making the views. So, you know, we're not hitting the, 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 right. Your, your bosses clicks. are constantly playing musical chairs with each other. Like yeah. nobody, yeah. nobody's privy to any of that shit until they walk in and hand you your walking papers. And they're like, yeah, yeah. Thanks for the great work. Good luck. I hope you have fun feeding your family, doing something else. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, and this happens all the time in film journalism it's insane i mean you know like uh, everybody still talks about this like which which should tell you how important this website was to writers my age like basically anyone from like 21 to 29 we all felt the loss of the dissolve and we still oh sure like we talk about that like it was like like the oklahoma city bombing or something (laughs) it was such a fucking blow to the idea of sustainable independent criticism. And I'm saying independent. It wasn't even independent. They were owned by a corporation. And if, yeah. and if Pitchfork, you know, who have their own festival, can't keep yeah. this site open, if for nothing other than for love of it, like, yeah. I was talking to uh, somebody about this, and he pointed this out. I hadn't even realized this. They didn't have ads on that site for what felt like ever. I mean, they did eventually get them, but... Oh, okay. I was going to be like, what? Yeah, exactly. So, like, no, like, you know, maybe that was a huge contributing factor or whatever, but at the same time, the fact that there weren't ads said to all of us who were reading it casually, wow, these guys must really trust these Sure. Others. Yeah. This content must be, they must know that it's as good as we know it as. And of course that wasn't true because they shut down two years later. And if they knew what they were doing, they wouldn't have let people like Noel Murray and Nathan Rabin go. Like those, those are great writers with big followings. You know, like they would like you, like I don't, yeah, I don't know. And that's like that's just it happens all the time. IndieWire just got bought and they had a huge staff shakeup. You know what I mean? Like really? the idea that they cr- closed Critic Wire to me is like that's. That's crazy. Like, people love that. I mean, if nothing else, the community loves that. Yeah. You know, like, and, you know, like, just, I don't know, this stuff happens, and, and I'm sure these decisions are being handed to people who don't really, I don't know, like, that they don't understand, that they don't, they don't take the temperature of the room before they do any sure. of this stuff. Yep. Yeah, that's the way I, uh, I mean, it's a similar thing in, in games writing. It's, there's, the mid and I think it's happening with every form of entertainment. The mid tier is kind of dissolving. You either have your like YouTubers who have you know don't have margins or anything. They're just you know making ad rev, right? Uh, talking into a camera, and then you have your huge sites that you know are in quotes too big to fail until they do. But of you know, I mean, there's like sites that are just like you know they're not going to go anywhere right. for a while. Uh, and, and then anything that's even in between, it's hard to keep that going. Right. I mean, like, you know, there's like, <laughs> and, and the kind of the public, the public knowledge, and I'm, well, maybe not public, the kind of like, I don't know, inside baseball or knowledge of, of some of this stuff is sort of hilarious. Like Silicon Valley last week, which is a great show, made a joke about Uproxx. Oh, right. <laughs> and that's like, that site isn't going anywhere. <laughs> like, yeah, it's, they figured their, they figured their model out. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, they, yeah, they're doing exactly what they need to to survive. I mean, all these things like slash film and and you know like whatever they like, they've got their thing and they're figuring it out. And you know you like they'll rebrand as they need to. Like, yeah, what's his name did for uh, uh, what was it? Ain't it cool news or whatever? Yeah, Mass digest or whatever that thing was that like they changed their name. That whole thing. They'll do what they have to to seem both relevant and, um. 
you know, kind of, I don't know, and, and, and uh, like, like public as well. There, there, there's this thing you have to be, you have to appeal to the broadest possible demographic, but you also have to have the, the sort of, uh, the, the veneer of class to it, but not too much because then you'll be accused of being whatever. Like, it's a minefield, and the energy that those sites like put into making sure that they tick all those boxes must be exhausting. But you know, and meanwhile, I have friends who are some of the greatest writers in the world who can't write for normal publications because they're getting edited to death. Yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, what a fun world, right? This is. <laughs> <laughs> like, if I <laughs> like. I really should have just started making comic book movies when I was 21. Sure. <laughs> I wouldn't have to worry about this nonsense. Yeah. Like, I bet the guys who make the fan Batman movies have more money than me right now and are probably getting Quite to make movies. Yeah. Uh, well, so, before that, whatever happened there, which was a great uh, tangent. A great hope what, tangent. <laughs> <laughs> what... How was film school for you? Oh, at the sure. end of the, did, right. you, did you finish out? I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I graduated in uh, 2011. Um, it was. And how do you feel about it? Because I there's the two camps with film school, with people I know. <laughs> they liked it or they hated it. <laughs> like they're like that was the worst thing. Don't do it. Or like yeah, it taught me a lot, and I think it was ultimately worth it. I okay. I I'm I'm gonna. I'm going to part your red seas here. I don't sure. regret right. going, but I don't think I was taught a thing at Emerson that, A, I couldn't have learned anywhere, sure. B, was worth my tuition. What okay. was worth my time was going to the Boston Public Library and the Trident Bookstore, reading every single book and magazine on film I could find, and teaching myself through the films that they're recommending to me, and then going like I would go and watch everything that I could possibly find at all the great rep houses in Boston. They were overflowing with them at the time. You had the Harvard Film Archive and the Brattle Theater, which is still probably my favorite movie theater in the world. Um, the Coolidge Corner and um, Kendall Square, which is a landmark, uh, and uh, the the Somerville Theater. And, you know, just like all you, anything you wanted to see, it might have taken a little while because it's Boston and it's not New York, but you could see it. Mm-hmm. And so I watched everything I could there. I took 10 movies a week out of the Boston Public Library. I watched as much stuff on the Internet as I could find. And I met my 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 crew. I met my filmmaking people. I met uh, Tucker Johnson, who's still my go to camera guy and all things. Um, I met. Uh, one of my lead actresses. I met my like AD on a first few of my projects, and those people, you cannot put a price on. Sure. So I would absolutely have gone and done the same thing over again because of what I did get out of the experience. Not necessarily the school, although there were some stuff that like some stuff that I was glad I did. For instance, there was an African cinema class taught by Claire Andrade Watkins that showed me. Uh, Jibril Jiab Membedi and uh, Abdurrahman Sasako and, uh, oh gosh, um, Osman Semban and uh, Haile Jarima and all, like, all this stuff I would never have known about without that stuff. It was the specialized stuff in Boston that made film school worth going to because none of my actual film craft professors cared or knew or really had any investment in you coming out of there a better filmmaker than you walked in. Sure. One of my film professors just uh, opened a distillery because making movies was too too thankless <laughs> because he couldn't get he couldn't get his movies financed or released. So yeah. he's selling booze now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great. So was that the feeling that a lot of these professors were you know, not failed, but struggling filmmakers that, like, were just kind of, like, jaded or... Well, he definitely was. I mean, Jesus Christ, that guy was, like... <laughs> he basically just had, like, a like a damp cigarette hanging out of his mouth the entire time sure. we were in class. <laughs> and, like, I had, you know, like, I had a, a great weirdo professor who taught us the history of American film comedy. And he, I asked him, I was like, how did you wind up here doing this? He's like, well, I wanted to be... A filmmaker, but then I used to see filmmakers at lectures and conferences, and they all looked miserable. <laughs> None of them were getting 
paid. I was like, all right, well, okay, thanks for that. <laughs> so he's an academic now because it just didn't make any financial sense to do the thing. And so if you can talk yourself out of it, you didn't really love doing it that much anyway. Because right. The thing is, I make movies for nothing. And maybe yeah. nobody sees them, but they exist. They're mine. I've made them. I'm proud of them. I have them. I've done that thing. And I'm going to keep doing it because it's not that it's necessarily easy. It's that it's possible. Yeah. I know I can do this because I've done it. I've made movies for $100 before. Like, once you buy the camera, can you officially call the camera expense a part of the budget of making this other movie? Because I bought the one camera for this film, and I used it for three others. And then I bought another one for another film, and I used it for three other films. You know what I mean? Like, uh, like I, I don't need a budget to make a movie. I will do it given that, like, whatever tools are at hand. If I have a cell phone and, uh, like, a lamp... And like you know, <laughs> a little shotgun mic that you plug exactly. into your phone. Like, if I if I had if I have no, I don't need lights. I don't need, I don't need money. I don't even really need a set. If I have an idea and I know I can do it, I'm going to do it because I like doing it. Because there is no greater feeling than knowing that you're making the work and having it finished and knowing that you did everything your way. Like, and maybe that stubbornness will always keep me out of you know, whatever Hollywood's fucking Rolodex, or even, like, Studio Canal's Rolodex, or whatever. Like, I don't know yeah. at this point who would even want me, because... A24. Yeah, A24. If you're listening A24, I'm around. <laughs> I'm <loving laughs> um, no, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. People watch my video essays way more than they ever watch my movies, and that's a fucking understatement. Uh, well, yeah, and, well, so, and how did that come around with, uh... Ebert, Roger Ebert. Oh yeah, so oh. that that was that was that was crazy. Like, so I had made it was uh, it was twenty twenty thirteen. It was the very beginning of twenty thirteen. I had made. What did he pass, by the way? Uh, he died that year. Actually, he died. Okay, that's I got why I was. Hired. The... Um, wow. Uh, like my my first essay and like the thing that like a question that I like I'm too afraid to ask is whether or not he like like was aware of me before he died. Like that's just. Like, oh okay. I don't yeah. Um. So he, yeah, um, Matt Seitz was put in charge of the website. Um, he left uh, the house next door, um, which I think was, you know, that like the video essays were him and Kevin Lee. Like there were examples in history, obviously, of video essays. Chris Marker is a famous example. Harun Faroqi and and uh, oh, you know, there there are, there are dozens of people who you could call essayists. But video essays, short form video based criticism, is that's Kevin Lee and that's Matt Seitz. They gave it to us in the form that we now know it today. So I had just released um, a trailer for this, like, widgety little horror thing called The Last Flesh and Blood Show, which you can watch online. It's like, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I still think it's fun. It's a mess, of course, but, like, that was sort of the plan anyway. So I made this film, I put the trailer online, and I was just, like, on Twitter one day, and uh, Matt, Matt Zolichites had just mentioned the fact that he'd seen Reality, the Matteo Garone film, um, and I went and started talking to him about it. And he looked at my Twitter bio, and he went on my website, and he watched a bunch of my trailers and short films. And he, so he watched the trailer to Last Election and Blood Show, and he made some joke about it in, like, a message he sent me. Um, and, and then asked if I wanted to pitch him video essays. And that was it. I was like, holy shit, like, how does this work? Like, <laughs> I, you know, I had seen his up until that point, and I knew exactly who he was. I had heard his interview on the Cinephiliacs, and I had watched his great series on the Malick stuff, and I had seen a bunch of the Kevin Lee things, of course. Um, but I'm like, I didn't have the kind of granular knowledge of film criticism and video essays that I do now, obviously. So I was, it was, it was a shock. So I had no idea what to do. Um, and so I pitched him this thing, which was kind of stupid as my first project because it was insanely ambitious. Uh, it was. Um, like a little history of the Cannes Film Festival. Um, I would pick a few years, and I would go through the selections and be like, here's what this lineup says about how where we were as a film culture up until that point. Here's, you know, we did 1960, so you've got La Dolce Vita and La Ventura and the birth of modernism, you know what I mean? Or at least the popular acceptance of modernism as a viable form, which of course leads to blow up and, and all this other stuff. Um, and then I did 68, which was canceled, so I looked at the lineup and saw there was all this revolutionary stuff, but because, you know, Godard felt bad that his friend got fired, they canceled the festival, and all these great movies from, like, countries with no film funding didn't get seen. Um, and that really pissed me off. I like, I like, I already didn't like Francois Truffaut, but after that, after, like, looking into that, I was like, you know what, fuck you. <laughs> um, 
And then I, I was supposed to do 79 and 97, because 97 was the last year before digital appeared. Um, uh, Celebration was the first film in competition that was shot digitally. Um, and uh, and so I was sort of going to look at that and be like, oh, well, here's the, you know, whatever, here's what the last gasp of an all-celluloid lineup looked like. Um, but again, I would have been smarter to do 98. I just like the films better in 97, so I was cheating. Uh, but it, and then I did 2010, which is all modernism. So that was kind of funny to go four years later, or 50 years later, you know, here's every film looks like La Ventura now. Um, sure. So I did those three. There wasn't time for 79 or 97. Uh, and then I did another thing about lateral tracking shots, which is kind of this weird, you know, personal thing. And I think sites liked it because it was, it was something that nobody else probably would have pitched, I hope. Um, and then... After that, I pitched him the Alien 3 essay, because I love that movie. I've been obsessed with it forever. Um, it's totally nuts, and it, it, at this point, I like watching it now, I can't even find the flaws in it, because I'm so used to them. You know what I mean? Like I've, I've accepted yeah. all of its problems, and I just think that movie's wonderful now. Is that the one written by uh, um, Judd? Why can't I... Oh no no no, Josh uh, Josh Whedon. He wrote the book. Well, yeah, um, Judd. Yeah, and Josh Whedon. Josh Whedon. Judd Whedon. Because uh, <laughs> his brother is Jed, and I was think for some reason Jed for some Jed reason. <laughs> okay, but yeah, so he wrote the one after that. He wrote Resurrection, and what's fun? Okay, okay. The script for Resurrection is it's just um, a backdoor pilot for Serenity. Oh yeah yeah yeah, I'd, I'd heard someone. Yeah, it's the same about. movie. It's Cowboys in Space. Um, yeah, that's all it is. Uh, so, but okay, Alien. So, Alien Three talking. was David Fincher's first film. Oh, okay, okay. Had, uh, I, I knew there was some connection of someone right. there that I knew. And a lot of people hate this film, and I get it because the movie they put in theaters is terrible. Uh, the Assemble thing is the one that I'm obsessed with. They went back, like I don't know, maybe like 15 years later, and they found all this footage that didn't get put into the original cut that people saw in theaters, and they made it longer. And to my mind, they made it better. They made it an, an interesting film. It's it's like. The thing about it is, it's the Fincher art film uh, uh, um, uh, blueprint. It's, it's everything he would do later, just like sort of, you know, in, in an embryonic stage. And so I don't see how most Fincher fans at the time didn't realize, like, didn't seek this out immediately. Because he had just done Zodiac when I saw, like, he did Zodiac and Benjamin Button. So he was like it. He was like the American kind of sure. director to watch. But anyway, so... I did this, like, 15-minute thing on Alien 3, so it's, like, way too long. Cut this down. <laughs> so, so I made it, I don't know, I think it's at this point. It still, it still feels like it's fucking endless. Like, I can't watch that video anymore. Like, it still feels so long. It's hard to go back and watch. Oh, God, yeah, really, of course. Especially video efforts. It's, it's easier to read something that's early because you don't hear your voice and it's not mm -hmm. visual. I, to watch. Yeah, I, I, well, I don't know. Maybe the, the, the construction of the Alien 3 one I don't hate. And the points I make, I still stand by. It's just a question of whether or not I could have done it just a little less seriously. Um, sure. By the time I did the, the essay on Tron Legacy, I think I had kind of figured my format out a little better and, and sound a little less pretentious, I hope. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so basically I pitched the Alien 3 thing. He really liked it. And he said, do you envision this as a series? And at that point, I hadn't. But I was like, absolutely, I do. <laughs> like anything yeah. to keep the, the circus going. Sure, sure. You know. Um. So I yeah happily signed on to do that, and I've been doing it ever since, and it's been amazing. I like you know. I, it, how many have you done so far? Um. Well, how many have I done? That's a great question. Thirty-one, maybe. Okay. Um. It's one. Yeah, one I, um. Hang on. I'm, what the hell was the last one? Oh yeah. So thirty. I've done thirty at this one. The last one was a Hitchcock double feature. It was tor torn curtain of Topaz. Um. And I yeah. When I got to the two year mark, I was like, this is insane. This is like the longest I've ever done anything. <laughs> 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 um. But it is. It's fun. It's it's tricky figuring out again to kind of loop back to the very beginning of this conversation. It's tricky to figure out what exactly still fits the criteria. When Phil Hoffman, Phil Seymour Hoffman died. Um, mm. I like I like to call him Phil, like I knew him. Uh, <laughs> Philip Seymour Hoffman died. I think we all felt like we knew. Yeah, him. it's true. Well, I also just kept hearing interviews with people who did, so they yeah. kept calling him Phil, and I yeah. just like used to do it anyway. Like I, Pat Healy called him Phil Hoffman, and I think that stuck with me. Pat Healy is wonderful, by the way. If you don't know him, he's a great actor. But uh, getting back on track, so I when Philip Seymour Hoffman died, I wanted to do Synecdoche, New York, because I remember that film getting kind of mm. trashed. Um, when it came out by a handful of people. Um, and 
but then Matt very sagely was like, that's not the same thing. That's, that's an art film that a few people misunderstood. That wasn't like a, like, that wasn't supposed to be anything other than what it was. It's not like like Lone Ranger or John Carter, which, like Lone Ranger especially. Lone Ranger is supposed to be this big, like, you know, like this big funhouse ride, right? And it is to yeah. a degree, but it's also a film about genocide. <laughs> so mm-hmm. it's kind of this weird two-headed thing. Um, and it's really little wonder that people were scared off. Also, we live in a culture of toxic buzz. I mean, like, it, it, I'm a little heartened, I think, now that one critic maybe has a little less impact than they used to. Not that the kind of like, you know, shark feeding frenzy critical system still doesn't exist where somebody says, sure. this is a disaster. Everybody else is going to be like, oh yeah, this is the worst shit I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, it's easier to side with the negative than to be like, actually, I like it. Yeah, exactly. I think. No, it's, it's absolutely true. And you risk, you know, and again, it's beyond that point for me because I've made this my thing. Like, this is my, <laughs> this is my, uh, it's my like it's my job, but like I think yeah. a lot of people don't want to risk being the guy who is constantly like, oh y'all are wrong, this movie's great. Like, sure, I can understand yeah. that as an unappealing career move to be the one dude who's constantly standing up for the stuff that everybody says is stupid. At the same time, I don't know, like everybody, everybody, everybody needs to fucking cool it with the hyperbole, like. I, yeah, definitely. Christ, like I'm guilty of it as anybody else does, but like I hope that like I don't know that like, there. Uh, there, I, I need to have a certain amount of hyperbole in these things because what I'm talking about are movies that everybody has called the worst film ever made for years. And so you got to be a little heavy handed to kind of get past. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, even the balance a little exactly, bit. Exactly. Exactly. Sort of like be like, I know you've heard this is the worst piece of shit ever, but really, you know what I mean? Like at long last love and sorcerer, all these films that I think sort of like where, you know, they, sure. they hung around forever just with these reputations as being failures and nobody challenged that. And that's insane yeah. to me. Yeah. Um, you know, like I, and, uh, you know, but like, you know, I would take a little even handedness or like a handful of contrarians to, the amount of times I see something like, okay, so like Warcraft just came out, right? Still haven't seen sure. it. I will eventually. I'll get to it when I get to it. Yeah. Um, but I read a review like by a guy who gets paid a lot of money, I, like yeah. certainly more than a lot of my friends, to write, who called it the worst thing that ever happened. And I know he was like fucking around. I know he was being whatever. But it's just like, yeah. are you goddamn kidding me still Yeah. in 2016 yeah. with fucking 120 years of... Like like, film that that you're still gonna go around pretending that this is the worst thing you've ever seen, even for a I know. joke. I I I totally feel that. I don't like. Uh, I don't like that. I don't know what. Like it's 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 kind of uh, been exacerbated by just internet trends and sure sure and, 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 and people and I, you know like you know, as much as I enjoyed it at some point. Like stuff like Angry Video Game Nerd, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with, or um, and who I even enjoy, like Nostalgia Critic or something, like these people that like rage, right? right? Like that's like like the rage critics that like this is Angry Joe or someone sure, on YouTube, sure, sure, or like like it's like this is the worst, thing, like and they, you know, I think that's kind of contributed to that culture and to that kind of oh sure because you know there's comedy there's entertainment value to that it's the reason sure that America is, yeah. watches Lewis Black specials because yeah, you know yeah. whatever it's yeah. like. Anger is fun. Yeah, and it's cathartic to a degree, but yes, yeah. It, 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 the problem is that that becomes it's. I mean, it's it's shtick. It's not. It's not analysis. You know what I mean? No. It's not. It doesn't necessarily add value to anything. right. You're a performance artist at that point. Yeah. You know, you're like yeah. that guy, that fucking film crit Hulk guy. Like I don't like he. I I don't know how that website runs, but if he gets money for those reviews, like somebody needs to fucking pull the plug on journalism <laughs> as a medium. Like, <laughs> because that's fucking absurd. Like, and just this idea that this dude who writes in all caps is getting paid to, like, write this, like, ridiculous faux pastiche thing of, like, and just, like, the, like the, how could anybody still be wowed by the novelty of reading mise-en-scene in all caps? Like, come the fuck on. Like, <laughs> what happened? Like, how are we putting up with this? I don't, like... That's a good question. And, again, like, again, and it was, so we're back to the despair. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, know. and so, to get back to... Something I think uh, Ebert was the opposite of that, you know. Like he was very positive guy. Like I recently to, to talk about actually 
going back to these disposable things. I've been going back and reading some Ebert reviews and stuff like that. Oh yeah, no, and like that's. I mean, that's again. He's. Uh, we we are very lucky that he had the team that he had to put all those. Well, that he up. was the voice. That he was. That that was the voice. Right. Right. That it wasn't the voice of these. Like you know that not that it existed necessarily in the same way before, but it wasn't the voice of these. You know, negative, very you know you know just inherently negative people. Right. Like, he was a very positive. He was. Well, and the thing is, he loved what he did. He loved movies. He loved. The insanity of, you know, like, even even when he kind of, you know, railed against it for a little bit and was sort of like, you know, like, all the con stuff. Like, that's all very fascinating. His relationship with the festivals, and then they had Ebert Fest. Like, he couldn't have loved what he did and where it took him more, and he communicated that, even more than Gene Siskel ever did. Like, yeah. Gene was a great writer, and Gene had a few wonderful ideas, but the reason Ebert stuck around a little more in the public's conscious is because he really loved what he did. Yeah, and that's why he got away with calling you know his books your movie sucks or whatever like you know like <laughs> he could get away with the negativity because we all knew yeah, he would yeah he obviously did it but you know I think he he was more positive he than was a lot more of positive them. and he he was the guy that we associated deep well, maybe not even deep but like we associated analysis of movie with that man and his face that we saw on television yeah. you know that was that was what he did and he brought. You know, more more than he whatever trashed, you know, you know Rob Reiner movies or whatever, you know, thing that he maybe is is more famous for. What he did was he brought people after he was done talking about the big film that week. He told you to go see Hoop Dreams, and he told you to go see Chan is Missing, and he told you to go see Dark City. He told you to go find the little films that he really liked and really approved of. He told you to go see Pola X. He he went to bat for weird. Films. He went to bat for tiny films that really needed to help movies that weren't going to get there on their own, you know. And he stood for them. He was, you know, he was their second in the battle of finding an audience. He was, he absolutely, he 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 cared. He really cared, and that came through yeah. more than anything. And that's, I mean, not to you know whatever. There there are people who who have that love. They do, but maybe the system has made it so that the people who really love something can't have the impact of the film the way that yeah. it had the impact in the nineties. Yeah, it it means a little less to have a critical champion, you know. Um, than it yeah, I don't know if we'll have it. Of I mean, he's the most famous critic. Oh yeah, hands I down. Mean, I I I can't think of anyone who's just of any kind. Like that is that famous or had that much of an impact, and I don't think we'll have one again, just because, like you said, the nature of the system and the amount of voices there are now. And yeah, and, and no, it's 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 tough. I mean, voice wise, and you know, with a sort of you know magnanimousness, which I don't know if that's a word, but anyway, like I, <laughs> Matt Sykes, I think magnanimity, mag, mag, magnanimity. Mag, <laughs> yeah, mag, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, Jesus Christ, I get paid for my words and <laughs> yeah. making them up. Um, Matt Seitz is definitely the closest thing I think we have, um, for sure, because he his voice is clear. You know it's him. He's easy to read. He's funny. Um, he has this. He has this. This kind of I don't know. There's a there's a warmth about his best reviews where he really wants the thing to do well. And he wants you to know why this thing's different and why it's special. Um, and I think he writes that. I mean, like I know my mom enjoys his criticism. She just got a subscription to New York Magazine and like was like real psyched that his his like his name was on the cover and all this. Like I, he he speaks to people. He really does. Um, yeah. But as far as I mean, I don't know that influence. That's a tougher one to quite. I mean, Jonathan Rosenbaum maybe kind of. I mean, he he sort of is. He, he ties himself to filmmakers more than films, I would say. Um, mm. Like, he just, you know, he's, I know he's very, very wrapped up in, in uh, Para Portabella, which, I mean, don't get me wrong, that's a great thing, but it's, it's less like, oh, yes, of course, this is the film that Jonathan Rosenbaum made sure that got made, because Jonathan is a, a wonderful, very, very, very intelligent guy, and I don't know that his writing appeals to the Ebert crowd, necessarily. Sure. Um, sure. Like, I love, I love, Jonathan now is doing a great thing where he's kind of doing, the, he's going the Eber route a little bit where he's putting all of his writing online, and I'm so grateful. He's posting stuff on Facebook and Twitter all the time, and I get to go back and read his Nicholas Ray piece from the 70s, and 
it's just I, I'm I couldn't be more happy that he's doing that because I really really love reading this stuff. Um, but I don't know I don't yeah again I don't know if we have a guy who or girl we should have more female critics and there should be sure. given yeah a larger yeah. stage and like I read um I forget her name she writes for a website called Polygon uh, she does a lot of their film reviews Polygon she's very it's a video game website, first and foremost, but they do movie oh. stuff, and I can't, I can't remember her name now, and I feel bad. But Well, yeah, I mean, I'll just say right now, just to, like, stop things, read In Kong, read um, Allison Wilmore, read Abby Bender. Miriam Bale doesn't write so much anymore, but when she did, she was great. Um, read Kate Erbland and uh, uh, Rachel Handler, and... Yeah, just like just uh, read Farron Smith Neme, read Susan Lesnitska, read I'm sure I pronounced that wrong, read Sheila O'Malley, read Monica Sheila, read read read. There are so many great female film critics. For God's sake, go find them and get outside of your comfort zone and yeah. read things from a different perspective. That's another thing that maybe I don't know. I really hope that if if somebody's going to step up and become Ebert, I hope it's a woman because yeah, America needs that in a big way. Um, yeah, we absolutely need we need that face to I don't know we need that face to be different than just a, like, well I think I think film needs that oh yeah you know? absolutely I mean just the people making the movies or being in the movies mm-hmm. yeah I like or editing like the Bastard. movies or that's who I want to become the next Roger Ebert Angelica Bastard <laughs> but also you know like read Ziva Blay and, and you know there's just there's so many Teal Bugby and uh gosh uh yeah, so a of, do yourself a, a favor and read a female film for this week. Yeah. Well, so I mean, what what's uh, Rap- what are you excited? What are some things coming out that you're excited about? Some movies. Oh, movies films. that I'm excited about. Okay. Um, all right. Well, Cosmos is the last film by Andrei Zulovsky. That's playing Metrograph in New York right now. That'll probably be on VOD before too long, or Netflix is my guess. You gotta seek that out. That is nuts and and just in the best way. Um, Robert Greene's film, Kate Plays Christine, is coming out. That's very important. You've got to see that. Robert's amazing. Caitlin Scheel is, I don't know, probably top ten young American actresses right now. Um, uh, let me think about this. Uh, do, you watch, um, do you watch big budget movies? Oh, sure I do. I'm, like, I'm, I, <laughs> like... The last, like, ten superhero films I've seen have just been, like, garbage, I don't care, but, like, Gods of Egypt just came out. Like, that movie is... Cool. Oh, no! It is hilarious. I love it. Well, sure, yeah. Did you see the director's, like... Oh, God, yeah, that epic... Public... Thing. I, like... I meltdown. Know. He had it easy for a long time, because he had Roger Ebert looking out for him. Um, yeah. But no more, man. That's a real problem. But, like, I, I still think he's worth watching, and I had so much fun watching Gods of Egypt. It's so loony. I loved it. It's like it's like Clash of Titans from the eighties. It's just like all sure. crazy actors doing things that they clearly don't care about, but they're like having a great time. <laughs> like yeah, like I yeah, I love Gods of Egypt. I thought that was so much fun. It actually has personality, which I can't say about the stupid X Men movie that just came out like that. Oh my yeah, I did not like uh... Natasha Leggero was just on some podcast and she was talking about seeing it with her with her husband and she was like, I felt like I was staring into a brick wall for two hours. I was like, yeah, that was a very boring movie. Um. I'm really psyched for Hunt for the Wilder People. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's like what he, he's a great yeah. guy. He's wonderful. Um, You're talking about someone who can bring personality to superhero movies. Yeah, right? He could do it. There you go. Thor. He's doing Thor. Oh, is he doing Thor? Oh, that's cool. He's doing Thor Ragnarok, yeah. Okay, well, that, that um, could, But, yeah, uh, he's... Uh, I. Um, what We Do in the Shadows is my girlfriend's favorite movie. Understandably, that shit is whole So, So we're, we're psyched for it. I don't know... Where it's gonna be playing? I'm, I'm in Phoenix, so it's not like exactly the cultural epicenter of America. <laughs> so, and the one, the one, so the one indie theater. It wasn't indie; it was part of the chain, but like it was like they're designated like this is the small theater that gets the foreign and indie movies. Right. They got rid of, and it was like the oldest theater in the valley, Jesus. and and now it's part of it. It's part of the mall that it's right next that it was right next to, and it's like, you know all the, the movies you'd normally see at any other movie theater. So it's just kind of, like, sad. Uh, <laughs> but I, I'm hoping somewhere we'll get it around here. But it's, yeah, I was just talking to... It's really, I mean, maybe, like, like, we go Perez or somebody, but he's, like, we're just, like, movies are, movies are in trouble. <laughs> like, they need to, yes. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I guess at some point we're going to get to a point where VOD is the, is 
same day as theater or it doesn't even come, you know, right. come to theater. It's going to be... Yeah, they're doing... They do that a little bit in England. Um, and I don't know if that's helping theaters at all. I don't I don't know about that. No, it's not. The theatrical experience, I think, needs to be preserved because it's really... Sure, fun. yeah, definitely. But it's also like... I don't know, man. It's like I don't. It's not feasible for everybody. Yeah, exactly. I don't have any goddamn money anymore. Like, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. For for viewers or for these, you know, smaller movies to get into those places. Right. You know, I played. I paid Queen's Rent, which isn't even as expensive as fucking like Manhattan or Brooklyn. Well, yeah. I mean, you're. I mean, ticket prices in. Where wait, where are you at right now? Uh, Queens, Astoria. Okay, so you do live in Queens. So I mean, like, I can't like. I, well, he was just in New York, and I, we went to saw a movie, and I was like, "Oh my yeah, god!" Yeah, dude, it's like you could you could have a fucking kidney removed for less money than it costs <laughs> to see movies. Yeah. Um, what the hell else was I going to say? Um, gosh. Uh, okay. Well, so definitely everybody who everybody who can and like find this, I'm sure this will line up on Netflix in a year, but definitely see The Laundry Man when that comes out because that movie is nuts. Um, and also the tag along that's also way worth your time um but uh oh also i'll just say another period is back on tv that show that's probably my favorite tv show yeah isn't that with natasha isn't that's that natasha Lager, yeah. show? and uh, ricky lindholm that show is yeah r- yeah uh um, oh and listen to Gar- garfunkel and Oates. yeah that's right that's right she kate was on as one of the uh league of uh i know what is it the national alliance of gal spinsters or something like that like she was fucking <laughs> I, I've tried to get them on this show, but I'm like, no, there's no way. <laughs> well, you never know. I've emailed her, uh, Kate's, Kate McCucci. So. Yeah, you never know. Um, oh, okay, another thing. Uh, listen to the band Cloak of Organs. They're wonderful. Um, they just put out an EP. They're really, really good. Um, uh, i trying to think if there's anything else that I need people to know about. <laughs> Yes. I'm excited for Swiss Army, man. I don't know what to think. I'm of two minds about that. <laughs> what what's what's the what are the minds saying? I I don't know, man. It sounds it's like on its face that could be the most gimmicky, like sure that ironic. Sounds, but, sure, you know I don't know, but like I don't know, it could be like I mean, I can't. I love. I think of the Harry Potter crew. Daniel Radcliffe is like the most like. He seems to have a sense of humor about actor. himself, which is good. Sure, yeah, yeah. But he's the most, like, devoted to acting, though. Like, I don't know, I mean, man. Emma Watson and Blair Ring, that's... Like, no, no, she's great. That's she's one great. of my favorite performances. But she's also, like, an academic. You know what I mean? Like, she, like, I don't... Not that it lessens her acting. I hear what chops. you're saying, though. I, like, I, I just feel like he's, like, he's done, like, some weird stuff. I think he just... I think he knows how to have fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and that movie looks like fun. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I guess that's that. Thanks for Thanks for having me. No, of course. What? Uh, what? Where can people find your stuff? Oh, right. Okay. So I'm on Twitter at at honors underscore zombie. Um, you can find Sergeant Troy on Bandcamp. Uh, you can find me on RogerDeber dot com. You can find me at Brooklyn Magazine. Uh, a bunch of my movies are available on Vimeo on demand. If you just search Scouts of Foya or Honor Zombie Films, you will find them. Um, I'd love to hear anybody's feedback. Uh, yeah, I watched some. I mean, I didn't watch anything fully, but I. You know, check out. I love the Unloved series. Thank you. Yeah, that's RogerEbert.com every month. You know, around the yeah, first. I gotta, month. I gotta go back and watch some of those. Yeah, thanks, dude. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think that's on the. That's what that is. But I'm also on Fandor. You can find me there. Uh, I've done a couple of video essays. I just did my first essay for No Film School. Um, so yeah, just always on the lookout for stuff. I've contributed to Movie Notebook, which is great. Danny Kasman doing a great job over there. Like, that dude, he's, he really gets it. Um, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, cool. Yeah. It was great talking, Scott. It was an uh, interesting conversation. I learned a lot about movies. <laughs> Thank you. Because I, I not... I like movies, but I'm not a uh, an expert on them, and Learning a lot about them well, recently. When you traded having friends for watching films in college, it really you better <laughs> you better know something. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, so next week on the show, who knows? As I was talking about at the top, need to get some people on the show. So, hey, help me out on all these various platforms. Reach out to people and uh, let me know who you want to see. So that's Facebook, Butterfly Effect Podcast, YouTube, Butterfly Effect Podcast, uh, Twitter, Butterfly Pod. And I'm on Twitter at Edeltod, E-T-T-L-E-T-O-D-D. Uh, Twitter's probably the best place to like reach me and be like, hey, you should you know talk to this person and tag that person, and then I'll see him. But oh yeah, okay, and hopefully that gets the thing going. Um, and then you can email me uh, at Gmail t r edelman at gmail dot com t r e t t l e m a n at gmail dot com, and uh, with suggestions, feedback, if you're representing anyone, all that fun business stuff. So yeah. I don't have anything else to say. That's the that's the uh, cleanup crew. I'm a little loopy. I'm gonna say, it's like three o'clock in the afternoon in Phoenix, Arizona, where it is currently like uh, hot, and that kind of saps your will to live. So I'm gonna go go find that will to live. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Hope to see you next week. If not, uh, I'm sorry. Talk to you later.